Oh, so I find out now people don't want to spend time to come to the house of God to corporately worship. And many of these same people, the Saturday, or Sunday just another Saturday, as though they're not spending time with their families. I saw an advertisement the other day where it said the average family maybe spends 32 minutes with each other. Folks, that can't happen. You might say, well, the kids are busy, this or that. Then maybe the kids shouldn't be so busy. Dad and mom are so busy. Maybe mom and dad shouldn't be so busy. Come on. Because my body, you know what? It's amazing. I'll tell you this. I'm going to do a little meddling. I'm going to do a little meddling here. And the words of Richard, you know, I said, be careful, Jeff. Be careful. Okay, you know. But maybe if we would give God his 10%, we wouldn't have to work two jobs. Oh, no. Now we're meddling, aren't we? Hallelujah. Maybe. My Bible says that when I give God my 10%, he'll open the windows of heaven upon me. He said he will rebuke the devourer for my sake. He says he will not, uh, he will not allow my fruit to cast off the vine until due season. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. Anybody want to say amen or out? I don't care what you say. Okay? But you know what? Maybe if we follow God, we wouldn't allow the devourer to come into our lives and steal and kill and destroy. This is all free. It wasn't even in my notes. Hallelujah. Okay? This is all free. Okay, I want you to know that. You might say, Pastor Jeff, 10%? Are you kidding me? That's a lot of money. I don't think so when I'm talking about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. You know what he has done for me? I'm telling you what, saints of God, I know I wouldn't be where I'm at today without the blessings of Almighty God. Amen. I tell you what, my wife and I, we have been fairly healthy, all these different, and I remember when we weren't healthy and Marilyn had to have kidney stones blown out of her, you know, our, uh, out, you know, with the little sonograms, and I had to get my gallbladder removed. I remember all those things, and we didn't have insurance, and we were, uh, we were on the thing for like $95,000. That's what our bill was. And I didn't know how we were going to do it. And I just said, Lord, you know, I've been faithful. And through man, because God uses men, God touched the woman at the hospital who was the business manager. She went and talked to the CEO of the hospital and said, you know what, Jeff went through some things he shouldn't have at our hospital. I think we should relieve everything but $5,000 of his debt. I, you, know, but I, you know what somebody said, boy, were you lucky. I said, no, I wasn't lucky. I tell you what, my God rebuked the devourer for my sake. Amen. Come on now, that's good, isn't it? Yes. Come on, yes. that's good. <laughs> Tell your face it's good, hallelujah, okay? I don't know if you, you really believe that or not, okay? See, and we need to realize worship is just not for Sunday. I tell you what, Sunday on Monday or Thursday, you know, I look at Jordan back there when he's up in the air, okay, hallelujah, uh, climbing poles and all that. I tell you, that's a great time just to put your hands in the air. You're already halfway to heaven anyway, hallelujah. You put your hands in the air and say, thank you, Lord, for giving me life. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a wife that loves me. Thank you, Lord God, for giving me three healthy boys. Thank you, Lord God, for giving me a healthy baby with my wife. You understand what I'm saying? You can start worshiping God up in the air. You can worship him as you're driving to school. You understand what I'm saying? God says, don't just relegate it to Sunday. Amen. Give him praise right where you're at. Hallelujah. I tell you what, that's what I think our little evangelist Gage is doing at the military. Okay? I think Gage is that kid that's letting his light shine. You know, I'm not going to tell you Gage is solely responsible for all these kids getting saved, but I think he has a part in it because your light shines. And the Bible says your light drives out all darkness. I think there's some kids that are away from home maybe for the first time trying to figure out life, thinking what's going on. And all of a sudden, Gage can tell them, say, you know what, this is how I was raised. This is my relationship with Jesus. Would you like to be a part of it? And maybe he's not leading them per se specifically to Jesus. His light is having an influence. Your light can have an influence on the people around you. Amen? God says, you know what? And when you and I set a day apart to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I tell you what, our light is shining bright in a dark area. Amen? Amen. See, God designated the Shabbat in the Hebrew faith that had been passed down certainly through the times of Christ to take time out of our schedule to corporately worship our Creator and have time for our family become one on Shabbat. Many of our families are running in opposite directions with work and school and sports and hobbies that Shabbat was created to bring us all back as one under the family, and yet they're not allowing the Shabbat the Sabbath, to do what it was created to do. Sometimes we just need to say, enough is enough. Amen. Mary and Joseph 
would have done all these things we're going to study here today. The eyes of Jesus, our creator, would have experienced these traditions week after week, month after month, year after year. What I'm going to explain to you what Shabbat is about, our Jesus' little eyes would have seen this. Okay? When your little kids, they're watching. Each Shabbat started with the lighting of the Shabbat candle on a table. Usually, the mom would light the candle, and the husband would come up behind her in front of the children. I know kids think that's gross. Oh, goodness, mom. Dad, don't touch each other. Hallelujah. Okay? Don't, no, you guys were not immaculate conceptions. Hallelujah. I want you to know that. But so, so the dad would come up behind the mom, and he'd put his hands around her, okay, in front of the children. And you know what? And the mom and the dad would be together. The father would hug and hold his wife, and the lighting of the Shabbat candle was to welcome the presence of God into their home. The family was acknowledging the presence of God in their house for a week. They were telling the Lord he was welcome in their home for that week. You know, should we have to ask the Lord? You know, the Lord says, ask and you shall receive. There's nothing, you know, somebody said, well, you know, don't you know, he's always welcome. You know, it reminds me of a story one time, you know, counseling, you know, a guy's been married 50 years and this older lady and couple came into the church and the pastor's office, they said, you know, we have marital problems. He looked at each other, 50 years, you know. And he said, yeah, the lady said, you know, he hasn't told me he, he loves me for 50 years. And the pastor looked at the guy and said, is that true? You haven't told your wife for 50? He said, yeah. I told her I loved her 50 years ago. I said, if anything changed, I'd let her know. <laughs> that doesn't work, guys, okay? <laughs> that doesn't work, okay? You need to tell your wife you love her. Jesus would have seen Mary and Joseph do this every week. Jesus would have seen his mother get ready to light the Shabbat candle and would have seen his, his dad come around and grab his mother and show about the love and invite the presence there. When we invite Jesus, the light of the world, into our homes, we're pushing away strife and inviting unity into the home. Come on, don't we need that? See, that's what a Shabbat is about. We're driving strife away and we're inviting unity. And, you know, that's what lighting that Shabbat candle is all about. We're saying, Lord, your presence, your unity is welcomed here. With the husband holding his wife, he's now saying, we may have argued up to this point. We may have had our issues. But no matter what has happened up to this point, we are having a rest. We're having a rest a Shabbat, from our arguments, from our strife, from our disagreements, from children fighting with each other, this all has to stop right now, right now, because the wife has lit the Shabbat candle and the husband is holding his wife. We've, come, we've, we've really gone a long way from this saying to God. Whatever is threatening to tear us apart, the mom and dad are saying, we're going to light the candle of his presence and welcome God into this place. Kids, maybe you've seen mom and dad fighting this week, but you know what? We're taking a rest from that. Whatever has been trying to tear us apart, we're going to light the candle of his presence, invite him and his presence and his unity to come in, and we're going to take a, a rest from all this junk. You know what I talk to people? You know what the first thing they almost always tell me is? They're so tired. Well, you know what? I think about this. You know, it's, didn't Jesus say in Matthew, he said, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden and burdened, I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He didn't say go and watch as the stomach turns. You know what I'm saying? Or any of the other things, okay? You know what I'm saying? He said, come unto me. See, Jesus says, come into my presence and you can have a rest, a Shabbat. And yet many times Jesus is the last place we go. You know, maybe you're having a tough time financially. God says, you know what, come unto me. Don't think you've got to go out and work three jobs because then you're never home for your kids and for your wife and it just complicates things even more. Come unto me and I'll give you rest. That's what the Shabbat is all about. Marriage isn't easy, 
But marriage is holy and it is God's plan for every family to be blessed. Marriage isn't easy. <laughs> you know, I, I jokingly tell people, you know, love may make you blind, but marriage sure opens up your eyes, okay? You know what I'm saying? It's the truth. Marriage isn't easy, but I know this. God calls it holy, and he says, I want to bless every family. Read Genesis 12. At the very end, and, and God says, and all the families of the earth will be blessed because of Abraham by blessing the Jewish people. See, the Shabbat is rest from problems. The Shabbat is rest from hurt, from misunderstandings, from arguments. This is evident as the husband holds his wife in front of his family. See, they're giving, folks, that's what our children need. They need to see mommies and daddies loving each other. Do you understand? And when, when that husband comes around and grabs his wife in front of his kids, those kids are saying, you know what? Mom and dad are united together. And you know what? With our school teachers and we have counselors here, man, kids have such a tough time nowadays with families being split and, and maybe relationships strained. And I bet you a lot of these problems could be solved if kids could see their moms and their dads loving each other. Amen? And I think that's really, really important. See, no, more, no matter what had happened earlier, the husband was to embrace his wife and they together were to invite the presence of God into their homes. It was customary on the Shabbat not only for the husband to embrace his wife, but to give, get this, but to, uh, but to give a Shabbat or rest of any strife from the home. But also, ladies, you're going to love this. Are you ready? The husband was to buy his wife a gift every Shabbat. And all the ladies said, <laughs> all his men said, man, alive, we're in trouble, aren't we? Okay. <laughs> Can you imagine that, ladies? Can you imagine if every Shabbat, you're, maybe some of you do it. I, I don't. I'm just being honest with you, okay? No, no. It's, we're, it's established in the mouth of two or three witnesses, okay? But can you imagine what would happen, guys, if you and I would bring our wives a gift every Sunday just to say thank you for what you do? Can you imagine what would happen there? Well, you know what? I think it would be very, very good. Every week, the children and their dad were to praise their mom and his wife. Look what it says in Proverbs 31, 28. Proverbs 31, 28 says, Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Ladies, this is pretty good. This isn't even Mother's Day, hallelujah. You know that. That's what the Shabbat was for. Can you see where our, our families and marriage has been torn apart in our culture? And if we can get back to God's book, God's ways, he'll bring them back together again, amen? And it's very, very important. First, they lit the candle. Second, the present is giving. And then the husband sings a song to his wife, and the children join in. Now, this would be terrible for me, okay? Because I can't carry a note in a bucket, okay? But you know what? What the husband would do, he would start to sing a song of appreciation and praise about his wife. Can, I, I just can't imagine, and, and unfortunately I haven't done this, okay? I'm not going to tell you, but can you imagine what a marriage would be like if every week daddy would come up and give his wife a hug in front of the kids, they'd invite the presence of God into their life, if they brought like flowers or candy or jewelry, and then he would sing a song of appreciation and praise to his wife? My goodness, the small families at Christ the King might have four kids. Hallelujah. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Not the large ones. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is this, that it's going to build a relationship with each other. The wife is going to really know how much the husband loves her, like Christ loved the church and was willing to die for her. All these things are a reminder to her that what? What a blessing she is to her family. How many parents probably think, Maybe all I am is a taxi. Maybe all I am is a breadwinner. Maybe all I am is this. You fill in the blank. Wouldn't it be nice if the mom said, no, my family really loves me and they bless me. It's not because of what I can do for them out there, but it's what I have done in the home for them. I have made the home a safe haven. 
we have invited the presence of the Lord here, that the kids can come in and they can find security and safety here. And it says, and her children will rise up and call her blessed. After all this comes the Shabbat meal. And get this, ladies, the woman isn't allowed to prepare it. Now, isn't it crazy? Women, in days gone by, especially probably not even that far gone by, maybe last week, okay, hallelujah, well, as soon as they get home from church, what do they have to do? Make a meal. <laughs> hey, it's Shabbat. We love you. Where's the chicken? Hallelujah. Okay? And yet the Bible says, no, on the Shabbat, no, the woman is supposed to be honored. And you know what? She's not allowed to prepare the meal. Either the husband hires someone to prepare it, or he and the children do it. Probably the husband and the children do it once, then they hire it after that. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter, it's her Shabbat. It's her rest day, and she isn't supposed to do anything. You might be thinking, man alive, what's going on here? But the Bible says that what? Jesus loved the bride, which is the church, and we're supposed to do the same. We as the head of the home, as the men, are supposed to show our wives, our bride, this kind of respect. Everyone stays to the end. Get this. No one gets up early. How powerful is it? When a family sits down and breaks bread together. Marilyn was super about this. We had four kids that were involved with sports and a lot of activities. She always made sure dinner, we sat down and ate a meal together. And it was powerful. Okay, it was very powerful, okay? When the meal is finished, the father speaks blessings over the children and his mother. What would it do for our families if we knew each Shabbat, each Sunday, we're going to sit down with each other and speak well of each other, hug each other, and give strife a rest from each other? What would that do to our families? No one gets to leave the table. No one gets to run off with their friends. No one gets to answer their cell phone. The computer games are turned off. We're celebrating being a family together. Hallelujah. Come on now. Come on now. Hey, you married him, okay? Now you're stuck with him, hallelujah, okay? They're your children. They're, you know, no. What would that be like? I'm going to ask you. When, you don't have to raise your hand. When's the last time, number one, you sat down as a whole family together? And number two, when is the last time you sat down as a family together and nobody picked up their phone? Come on now, now I'm meddling again too, aren't I? And God is saying, you know what? Don't let the cares of this world come in and steal your family, your blessings, okay? Very, very important. The next morning then, you know what they do? They'd get up and they'd go to synagogue together and hear God's word. And in the afternoon, they'd do something together as a family. If children, if the children were small, they would carry the children on their shoulders and tell them stories about how God delivered them from bondage. In fact, in Deuteronomy 1.31, it says, and in the wilderness, this is what the Lord is telling them, and in the wilderness where you, sh uh, where you saw the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the ways that you went until you came to this place. See, the dads would grab the kids and they'd tell them about all Jesus, or in the Jewish, all what God had done for them. Dads and moms, we need to tell our kids what Jesus is doing for us. Amen. We need, they need to know that Jesus is more than just some guy, some guy that we think is up in heaven. No, he's every day in our lives. When Meryl and I, when good things happened in our lives, and we had a lot of wonderful things in Indiana, we always told our kids, hey, you know what? This is what Jesus did for us as a family. This is what Jesus did for us for a family. Well, this is what Jesus, we, we didn't want them to think it was the craftiness of mom and dad that got it done. It was what Jesus was doing for us. So then they would go to synagogue, okay? And look what it says in Deuteronomy 6, 7. It says, you shall teach them, the, the, uh, actually, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. You should teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. Turn off the television. And when you walk, by the way, when you're going out for a family walk, and when you lie down and when you rise up. So maybe moms and dads, if you have to go in and talk to your kids in the morning, wake them up, why don't you go in and wake them up and say, hey, you know what Jesus has for us today? Tell them about the goodness. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, Jesus needs to be an everyday participant in our family. Amen. Yeah. And dads and moms, that's on us. Okay? And that's what it's all about here. Over in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, 
Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart. The word train or teach is kind of interesting. That means make an impression upon them. And I read some other things that said to make a bite mark. Anybody have a biter if we're a kid? We had a couple of them. Oh, my. You would hear them screaming. All of a sudden, the other one, they bet. You knew exactly what happened. There was a biter in the family, okay? See, we're to teach our children the ways of God, and we're supposed to leave a mark on them. Why? So when they get old and they start to wander from the path, they can look down and see the bite mark. That was what their ways were taught about Jesus that will bring them back on the straight and the narrow. Amen? It's kind of interesting. I ran across a Danish proverb that says this, what youth learns, age does not forget. What youth learns, age does not forget. We need to teach our children when they're young, because in the age they will not forget. Over in Luke chapter 15, okay, and this is the, prod, this, uh, the story of the prodigal son. It says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have enough bread and despair, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. What happened to the prodigal son when he was in the middle of the pig pen? I think he saw the bite mark. Mm -hmm. He saw the bite mark from his dad and mom raising him up. He had departed. He had gone and wasted all his, his living, on, all his earnings on riotous women, uh, living, the Bible says. But you know what? Then he came. When he got old, he happened to look down and he thought, there, what's that bite mark? That was mom and dad investing the word of God into my life. The Bible says, and the word of God will not return void, but it shall accomplish all you send it out to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Parents, we need to leave, not literally, but spiritually some bite marks on our kids. They need to see growing up in the family. You know what? I remember maybe mom and dad, maybe they had arguments, but you know what I remember? They came together, they asked for forgiveness, they loved each other, they hugged each other. They're leaving a bite mark on my, in my life. How do I deal with situations in my life? Do you understand? They're teaching me how to treat people with dignity and respect. Those are bite marks that God wants us to train our children in. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, these are the words of Jesus. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. See, if you and I let Jesus in, he will become our Shabbat candle, our light. And you are his bride. And you know what Jesus will do? He'll wrap his arms around you and he'll tell you, you don't have to do anything. He will provide for all of your needs according to his riches and glory. He wants to put his arms around you and me and hold us and tell us to say, let go of the past. Let go of the guilt. Let go of the shame. Let go of the regrets. Let go of the anger. Let go of the offenses. Let go of the bitternesses. Today is your Shabbat. Rest from all those things. That's a Jesus. I don't know what these other people are talking about, but that's a Jesus to me. Not just some guy we, 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 we sing about. No, this is somebody we know intimately. And he wants to come and tell us we can rest from these things. I love this. Over in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. If you don't know where Zephaniah is, it's in the very back of the Old Testament, okay? It's between Malachi and Zephaniah and Zechariah and those guys back there, okay? But, but in Zephaniah 3, 17, it says, Almighty God, this is amazing. Remember, what did the man do to his wife? He sang a song to her. The Almighty God will sing. It says, the Lord your God is in your midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but can't you just see we, the church, are his bride? Amen. And we're going through things in life. And you know what it says here? The Lord's going to come and he's going to quiet you with his love. He's going to rejoice. He's going to say, you know what? Rest from all these things the world is trying to put on you. Today is your Shabbat 
okay? And before it's all over, you know what? He speaks words of blessings over you and your family. What do we do every week here, saints? The ironic blessing. Yeah. See, that's God. And you know, this is what happens if we don't take a Shabbat, a day of that's set aside for corporate worship and for our family. See, if we don't deserve, if we don't observe the Shabbat, you know what's going to happen? Your body will wear out. Your mind will burn out. And your spirit will dry out. I can say that again because it's so true. Your body will wear out. Your mind will burn out. And your spirit will dry out. You say, how do you know that? Because I've been doing this for almost four decades. I tell you what, I have seen people think that they don't have to observe the Shabbat or the Sabbath. And I have seen their minds and their bodies and their spirits all take a toll. Is God mad at them? Nope. I just know this, that when we go against God's laws, it only breaks us. But when we follow God's laws, we're blessed with them. Amen? And so I'm glad you guys decided today to take a Shabbat. To rest. I hope maybe you can incorporate some of these things maybe in your family, maybe on a Saturday night or, you know what I'm saying? And, and I know the women are thinking, yeah, I think I wish you get this gift every week too, hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? That would really be a great thing to start with. I, I understand that, you know. But, you know, dads, don't be afraid to grab your wife in front of your kids, just hug her and sing her praises in front of your kids. You know, I've always told people, if you want to know how a little boy is going to treat his wife, see how a little boy treats his mother. Because that's how a little boy will treat his wife, how a little boy treats his mom, okay? And I just, and I tell you what, if our young men can see their dad loving their mom, it's going to be a great example. And if our young girls can see how a woman is to be loved by her daddy, it's going to set a wonderful example for them when they go to find someone that God to bring into their life. So I want, you know what? It's going to be hard. It is hard. It's hard to keep the Sabbath. It's hard, okay? We get pressured, but I'm telling you what, what you and I might think we're giving up, God is going to give us more in return. Amen? Amen? And I tell you what, it doesn't matter what's going on. I think all of you are here today because of one reason. You love your family. And I think family is one of the most important things in all of our lives. And that we need to guard our family. We need to say, no, we're not going to let all this stuff of the world tear our family apart. No, God made the Sabbath, the Shabbat, so we could come and corporately worship together, and then so we could also come together as a family and be one. And I tell you, when we do that, the world will look at us, and they'll call us blessed. You know what the world might say? You're lucky. No, there's no luck about it. It was something that we planned and purposed not to let the world steal from us. Amen? Why don't we stand up? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for giving us a day to cease from our work, Lord God. A day that we can set apart to corporately worship you. The other six days, Lord, you want us to individually worship you. But on the seventh day, you want us to come together and corporately worship you, Lord. You want us to bring our, not only a, a worship you, to you, but Lord, but bring our families together. We want to see husbands and wives be brought together. In fact, in the book of Malachi, he said in the last days that he would bring the hearts of the men and uh, hearts of the children back to the fathers, and the hearts of the fathers back to the children. See, our God is in a restoring business. And he's given us the Sabbath, the Shabbat, to restore. Are we maybe going to lose out on a few things? Maybe. But I tell you what, it's all worth it when your kids are older and they call you back up, tell you thanks, Dad. Thanks, Mom. Or calling up and say, what are, you, what are you doing, Mom and Dad? I just haven't heard from you for a while. I just want to talk to you. Yeah, sometimes as parents, our rewards maybe come 10, 15 years down the road. I understand that. But you know what? We know our God is faithful. We know our children have those bite marks. And maybe they've gone a little weary on the side, but we know, you know what, Lord? 
You're going to bring them back. That's a promise you gave us. Thank you, Lord, for blessing the families here at Christ the King. Thank you, Lord God. We as dads are going to guard our families. We're not going to let the influences of the world come in and steal and kill and destroy. We're going to love our children's mom. We're going to show them what it's like with Christ loving the church, his bride. And I thank you, Lord, that our families are blessed. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.